Okay, hi all. Um, you're very welcome to yet another event as part of our interview series with D2 Consulting. Um, I'm Liz and today I'm very privileged to be joined with Nigel Smith, the current Group Strategy Director of Greencore PLC. So Nigel also happens to be an alumnus of Trinity where he studied European Studies from 2006 to 2010, if I'm correct. Um, where he was, of course, a student of distinction, achieving or receiving both the Entrance Exhibition Award and the Gold Medal upon graduating. After graduating then, Nigel worked um, a, across a various, uh, I suppose, worked in various roles in public policy um, and government before entering consulting and before entering McKinsey in 2014. In McKinsey then, he exceeded expectations and was promoted from an analyst to associate um, in only two years. So he then joined uh, Green Corps in 2017 as special advisor to the CEO before being promoted to the group strategy director in March, 2020. So in saying all that, Nigel, we're extremely, um, I suppose, we're delighted to have you on board today um, and to hear more about your career path and jumping from, of course, policy government into the consulti consulting and then of course uh, a, a corporate role. And I think it's only just that I start off by exploring kind of uh, your experience in Trinity. Um, so as, I'm, as I said above, um, you enrolled in Trinity uh, in September 20, 2006. Um, and I, what I'd love to know is as a Leaving Series student in Dublin, um, I suppose what made you choose specifically European studies and of course um, Trinity as a college? Yeah, well, um, funnily enough, actually, as a Leaving Cert student, I, uh, I didn't choose uh, Trinity or European Studies. Um, I, I started out in uh, started out, uh, doing music in the Academy of Music at the, uh, the back end of, of Pierce Street. Um, so I spent a year in there embarking on a, on a career as an opera singer, short-lived. <laughs> across the road. <laughs> Just across the road, exactly, yeah. But, um, but, but in the end, kind of stepped away from that. Um, for a, a, actually, yeah, I suppose a set of reasons linked to Trinity in the sense that, um, I mean, a career in music is uh, is you know really enriching and and uh, and and um, and rewarding in its own ways, but extremely dedicated and focused. And what I was finding um, in in that world was um, that there wasn't kind of a whole lot, of, whole lot of scope for 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 other things. And so, going to Trinity and going to to do European studies, which I think is probably the course that is. Um, most uh, suitable for people who haven't figured out what they want to be when they grow up yet um, uh, was, was really attractive and so the ability completely yeah exactly and so to do that and to plug into a number of the societies um, in, in Trinity as well um, great to see that there's now a, a consulting group getting up and running it uh, on, on, on top of the likes of drama or debating that I was doing back in what feels like an age ago now at this stage so, uh, so no it was just great to be part of the, the Trinity community. Nice. Um, following on from this, then, yeah, I suppose if you were here to put yourself in the shoes of eighteen-year-old Nigel, um, do you remember if you if you had, you know, once you had entered European studies and kind of settled on that as a, a degree, um, did you have any, I suppose, objective of what you wanted to achieve during your years in college and, and of course, thereafter after graduating? Uh, you're, I'm probably supposed to say, you know, yes, absolutely, absolutely and not, no. Uh, uh, but I guess the main thing was to have a bit of crack. <laughs> um, so, um, so, I mean, it was just a case of, um, as I said, I, 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 I kind of went in uh, knowing that there was a kind of series of areas of, of interest for me and uh, certainly studying languages was, was part of that. I know you, I know you, you, you study French yourself, Liz, which is that uh, which you've got in common. Mm -hmm. um, but I was really trying to just broaden, broaden horizons and actually use the time in college to to figure out a little bit more about what what my options were and and uh, and where I'd like to spend some time and of course inevitably um uh, what what felt like the plan 10 years ago was uh, is, is is not the plan that uh, that, that worked out but uh, I'm, I'm 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 pleased enough with kind of how the last 10 years has gone but I guess the message to, to anyone in, in your society would be um it's definitely a minority of people who know at 18 or indeed at 22 um when they come out the other side of college um what, what what they might be doing at 32 or 42 or 52 yeah so. yeah or even what's out there i i couldn't agree more and i think i find that extremely reassuring to hear that from, from <laughs> someone like yourself um and i suppose then yeah during your time in trinity i suppose this is relevant for any third years out there 
Um, did you undertake any kind of summer internships or stage or course placements that were then relevant for your next steps? So as well as being like entirely directionless and like as, as a, by the sound of things, I, I was the uh, of, uh, of um, maybe the, the kind of archetypal uh, driven um, uh, you know, internee in that I, um, you know, I didn't go to McKinsey or Goldman. Uh, I spent my summers uh, playing computer games um, and I was paid for the privilege oh, wow. <laughs> working for a company called Activision. Um, they're um, testing testing the, the French versions of their uh, of their kind of upcoming releases. So if you kind of dig back into the annals of, I think it was like Guitar Hero Three or Medal of Honor and Spider Man, a whole rake of computer games was uh, was what I spent my time doing. In, in theory, building my building and sort of flexing my my French language muscles, but understanding really just the experience, like, what not? Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> great stuff. Great stuff. <laughs> nice. Um, I suppose I'm naturally going to follow on then um, and talk a bit about your shift into consulting then so after university um if i'm correct you worked in brussels then for three years so you worked in yeah. the eu council in, in, in grayling and the eu commission uh before joining Kaminzi, uh, mckinsey um yeah so what i suppose urged you to then shift from uh, i suppose those specific roles in government or policy and then into management consulting yeah, it's a good question. So there's probably a couple of elements in that. Um, I, I, I headed off to Brussels, um, not necessarily with the intention of, of, uh, of staying forever. Um, uh, I did a master's in, in Bruges and then kind of transferred down the road to Brussels like a lot of my, like a lot of my classmates. Mm -hmm. um, I had a really formative experience working for, um, work with the Department of Foreign Affairs actually in, in the Brussels um, permanent representation during the, uh, the time that Ireland had the EU presidency back in 2013, um, which was just fantastic in terms of professional experience and really formative, um, both in terms of the substance of, of, of the work we were doing, but also working actually for an ex-consultant um, who was a bit of a mentor to me. And so when it came to the end of, of the presidency, um, uh, you know, we were kind of chatting about what, what next. And he said, hey, you know, have you, have you thought about consulting? And, and kind of it, it went from there. I, Kind of looked at the options and, and applied to McKinsey and um, and, and kind of transitioned. Um, the, the process t took so long or takes so long that in the meantime I started working in the European Commission and um, and actually cho chose to stay there for about eighteen months because because I was having a bit of crack there as well and didn't want to mm -hmm. you know didn't party too early. But, um, uh, but but actually what what ended up happening it's it's a funny one in that um, I went to two different people's retirement at the European Commission where they both made independent of each other they didn't know each other made the same joke that like oh they'd only just come to brussels you know back in the 70s to do an internship for six months and sure look at now they're here they are at their uh at their party and that, that set off a bit of an alarm bell that said before you know you, you kind of get you end up staying there forever and it might be time to make the change and so and so kind of did did take up the mckinsey offer so um, nice but but really did and, and really good to have um really good to have had had experience on the other side of the fence rather than just jumping into to, to consulting straight away. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll, I'll try to touch on that a bit later as well. Um, did you find it hard then to transition from your work with the EU and then into, I suppose, the fast paced, I suppose they're both fast paced, but the intense in-depth business work uh, involved with McKinsey? Yeah, um, it was a tough, I think it probably helped in the round. There's, there's certainly sort of pros and cons to it, but um, uh, I guess one thing that was just like objectively true when I joined in my analyst class in McKinsey was that I was just painfully old. So because of um, because of uh, kind of the you know the singing thing and then Trinity and then a master's and then a few years in Brussels, I think I was I was probably twenty eight when I started. And uh, what what brought it home to me was um, there was someone who was celebrating her twenty first in my intake class, and I was just like, right, here we go, I am up the hill. Um, but uh, but I think in the round that really just helped because it. Uh, uh, it, it was surprising how transferable skills are. Uh, maybe it shouldn't be surprising in 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 hindsight, but um, you know, it's it's very easy to kind of feel daunted when you start something new and, and kind of feel like you're relearning everything. But actually, the, the kind of muscles that you build in in one area are, are are very much applicable elsewhere. And so, if I think about some of the work that we're doing in the Commission or in in, in the Department of Foreign Affairs in terms of analysis, in terms of project delivery, in terms of just relationship building and and engaging in the world like a like a you know, a 
forming or formative professional it's very much helped in um, in the in the McKinsey context um, and I, I guess as this relates to to maybe some of the people who are, who are, who are listening here today in terms of a pathway in consulting it's that um, it, it's that it's rarely a straight line you know and if you the option is is always there both to sort of go into and leave or indeed to kind of go off and do something else and and uh, and, and work your way back it's yeah, uh, even though it might have felt like I was over the hill at the time, it certainly uh, when I joined, it, it didn't it didn't feel like that kind of living the day to day experience. So, um, so yeah, all in all, I think a positive. Yeah, once again, I think that's probably a reassurance to a lot of the audience. I think at the moment, for my personal self, there's almost an implicit pressure to you know get your specific internship and graduate role and follow in a linear line thereafter. <laughs> but yeah, I, I yeah, love. Don't worry about that. It's a it's marathon. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, okay, so we, yeah, another, another, I suppose, deep dive question we have here, and, and obviously we, we only want a bit of an insight, but in your time in McKinsey, we noticed that you progressed quite rapidly from, from analyst to associate, and we're just wondering, could you share potentially a bit of insight on how you achieved um, that promotion? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't over egg that. I, I spent two years do, being an analyst and they promoted me to to, uh, to associate, started managing projects and stuff. Um, uh, people uh, people kind of progress at their own pace and a lot of people choose to kind of head off and do something else um, in in between kind of moving from analyst to associate and go and join a startup or go and study in business school. I kind of just plowed on through in part because of what I was just talking about in terms of having a, had a bit of, McKinsey experience um I think that definitely helps you know just just having been out in the world a little bit and and um I was gonna say no 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 more what you want no a little bit more what you want <laughs> it's all it's all relative you know you know you no know more at 28 than at 22 and and no more at 35 than at, at 28 it's a, it's a bit of a journey but um I think that, that that helps to kind of keep a bit of focus but um uh, but yeah, I, th I think uh, certainly in the McKinsey experience, and I suspect with, with an awful lot of um, of other consultancies as well, there's, there's just an awful lot of structural things that are put behind you to um, to help make a success. It's I, I can't speak for other types of industries which have a kind of more cutthroat uh, reputation, but you know my experience in McKinsey absolutely was that everyone that you encountered wanted you to succeed, was there to help you to succeed, uh, there to challenge you absolutely, and there to to push you and stretch you, but um, but no one's trying to catch it out. You know, the, the you know success is celebrated, pro um, progression is celebrated, and you know one one person's progression is is kind of really felt and owned as a collective um, progression and, and 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 success. And and I think that's it's just a really positive environment to be in, really. Interesting. Okay, you you touched on something there. You said um, yeah yeah as as you go, you kind of learn of what you want to do more. Um, and I suppose yeah, <laughs> or or of course what you don't want to do. Um, but I, I see, so you you went from, you know, external, externally related, uh, I suppose you weren't in consulting initially, you moved into consulting at McKinsey. And then after you're, of course, in, in, in Greencore now, it's in the corporate realm. Do you think that for, if there's, I suppose, students watching who potentially would like to end up in a, a leadership or management position in the corporate world, do you think that, you know, consulting is a right not necessarily entry into it, but perhaps something that's valuable as an experience prior to entering, uh, you know, the corporate world. Or vice yeah, no, versa. Fantastic. Yeah, and, and as you say, vice versa, I think there, there is a kind of a, a back and forth, but certainly in my own experience thinking about, um, thinking about Green Corps, um, uh, well, <laughs> In my case, it maybe speaks a little bit to the the incestuous relationship between the corporate and the consulting world, and that my kind of route in was was because um, my uh, my current boss, the the, the CEO here in Greencore, used to run McKinsey Dublin, and so when he was looking for um, for someone to give a bit of help out, um, the kind of the, a natural protocol was McKinsey, and so so it, it certainly helps from a from a network networking point of view. Um, there's probably positives and negatives to to that. Um, uh, but as it relates to kind of the core skills and the core um, kind of set of experiences that consulting will will teach that are, are transferable to the corporate world, and it's 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 just absolutely um, uh, absolutely the case that 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 there's an awful lot of transfer transferability between the between the two, whether it's 
you know, whether it's problem solving, whether it's analytics, whether it's, you know, communication, whether it's, uh, whether it's just pure relationship building with people, um, all of those kind of skills that you, that you learn and, and build up in the consulting world are just very directly applicable in, in the corporate world. Um, and, um, and if you kind of learn, you, 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 there's, there's a certain, there's a relatively narrow set of skills, particularly at sort of analyst associate level in, in, uh, in consulting, you know, around, around sort of hardcore analytics, around um, problem solving, around, you know, literally even, even building good quality written communications. Mm. It, it sounds boring. Like it's not necessarily something that everyone has at their fingertips in the corporate world. And the ability to just kind of knit together a narrative that says, this is the idea I want to communicate to you. Um, this is what I need you to do at the end of it as a result of what I've just said. Mm. Now please go and do it. Mm. Um, it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a superpower that the, that the, that the consulting um, um, uh, firms kind of imbue and just become second nature. And when you kind of take that into a different context where not everyone has been kind of trained in the same rigor or trained in the same way or expects the same thing, um, it, it, it certainly has, 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 yeah, has right. uh, so, so uh, yeah, definitely, I've, definitely, definitely helped. I, I've definitely, yeah, I've, I've definitely heard that being said quite a lot uh, and a lot of inside days or, or, or such events like this. And they often refer to it as, I suppose, the consulting toolkit. Um, yeah. Often, yeah, developed and then plus transferable. Um, I suppose, yeah. Um, did you then find it hard working in an environment, I suppose, from McKinsey that was, you know, everyone was potentially had a piece of this toolkit and was used to working in that kind of environment of, of structure um, to then you ne not necessarily being the only one, but perhaps one of the only uh, ones using it in Green Court? Or do you think... Uh, it was it was just value added. Where was it was it difficult? Yeah, no, it's a it's a very good question. Um, and I guess like like most things, it sort of has it has its its upsides and its and its its downsides. In that, um, uh, on the upside, it's um, kind of looking at the world in a certain way, um, kind of being primed and and almost a mental expectation around delivery and around pace. That means that when when you kind of just point yourself at something. And then either get it done or get to an answer or kind of push the thinking along. And um, there's an awful lot of people who who will kind of respond very positively to that, and uh, and and kind of that that helps kind of build a level of credibility or a level of uh, you know trust to do to do more and to take on more, mm -hmm. um, which is definitely definitely helpful. Um, uh, there's always a watch out, you know. Um, if you spend if you spend your time as I did in McKinsey, kind of hanging around with a lot of you know uh, young. Oxbridge types um, who are, you know, of a certain, you know, McKinsey would say the same uh, that, you know, there's still a bit of work to do to, um, to enhance the, the kind of breadth and diversity of skills that are brought into uh, to, to the consulting firms kind of on a journey there, but not quite there yet. And you then turn around and come into a business in um, like we have here in Greencore, which is, is very hands-on, right? There's 12,000 people work for Greencore and, and the vast majority of those work come to work every day in, in a manufacturing environment, um, uh, making food. It's very manual, very labor intensive. Mm. And if you're the kind of bloke who swum, sw uh, you know, swoops in with a set of PowerPoint slides and is like, oh, I've, you know, I've done some thinking over here in my ivory tower and this, here's what you need to do. <laughs> like that's not gonna, that's not gonna work for everybody. Um, and you need to, there's, there's a piece around kind of um, uh, somewhere between self-awareness and the understanding of what the skill sets that you don't have, the experiences that you don't have and the value that they bring, you know, the person who, who stands on a line obsessing over um, uh, how much wastage there is on a piece of ham and how to cut it or how to, how to gut an avocado in order to get the most avocado out of that, out of that um, raw material input has a whole load of insight that you're not going to find in a spreadsheet necessarily. Um, and, and there's a real need um, to be able to kind of take the skills that you have from a consulting environment, but realize that when they hit the, the real world, um, that they're only partial. Uh, and to kind of get to a great answer for a business, you, you kind of really need to look look at in the round what everyone can bring. Interesting. Yeah, I, I definitely value that as well. Um, following on, I suppose, from that, um, which is perhaps a, a similar question, but how did you find going from working in McKinsey with a vast array of different sectors and, and industries to one specific one? Yeah, um, I guess in some ways it was um, uh, liberating might be the right answer in that um, 
um, the, the, the kind of, you know, interesting and pacey thing about McKinsey was that um, you had, you know, very four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks to go solve this one problem mm. and, uh, and to get after it. And, and the sense of achievement that comes at the end of a six week project where, you know, you, you knew nothing about the area, the industry, the client. And at the end, uh, you um, you might not have uh, kind of quite delivered every uh, aspect of change that you're recommending. And that's one of the challenges that comes to a consultancy like McKinsey as distinct from kind of other operational cons- consultancies that, you know, they kind of work out the answer, hand over the, the story and then go cheerio. Mm-hmm. Um, but at least by that kind of period, you'd really gotten under the skin of a problem. You'd found a perspective on it. And you'd, you'd, you'd come up with um, a version of what, what, what the answer was. That's quite different in, in the corporate environment in that there's, um, there's much more interlinkage um, between the different strands of, of activity of area of challenge um, and uh, and as a result it's relatively rare that you'll start something you know on day one and six weeks from now you've kind of you're drawing a line under it and saying right that's it that's done that's delivered mm. and that affects the, the the challenge that comes with that is you don't quite get the same very very short um, feedback loop um, and cycle time that, that comes in consulting projects and um, but the flip side is that you've by being around Longer by seeing it as it kind of progresses and, and actually moves, not just from kind of thinking about the problem, but actually delivering it, solving it, launching the product, opening the opening the facility, buying the business, buying the business. Um, that there is a kind of deeper sense of achievement that comes with that than than kind of simply just sort of coming into to, to an organization, spending spending some time with them and then and then kind of leaving at the at, at the other end of that. Absolutely. Yeah. Um yeah, I suppose. What's relevant to that then is, could you expand a bit more on your day-to-day activities? Uh, I know it's probably fast, or it's, it's you know, changing from day-to-day for you, but is there any way you can share a bit of insight perhaps this week, what you've been up to? Yeah, well, this week has been very much focused on, we've got our, um, we're announcing our, our full year results in a couple of weeks' time, uh, at the back end of November, for um, what was, uh, I'd say a different year uh, for lots of different reasons. And so, um, you know, there's a regular cycle of, of shareholder engagement, um, you know, once a quarter and in, and in particular uh, once a year as we release our results and our annual report. So a lot of activity around that as we, as we kind of refine the annual report, as we, you know, finalize the numbers that, that we'll share with the market in a couple of weeks time, finalize the kind of messaging that, that sits around that and, and how we, um, how we communicate with a whole series of stakeholders around that time, whether it's, you know, shareholders directly, but also the customers who will pick up on that messaging, our own our own uh, colleagues who will pick up on that messaging, and so and so crafting that is 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 very much kind of top of mind at the moment. Um, but I think I guess more more broadly, uh, it's it's the real cliche to say there's no there's no typical week, but um, uh, in the in the time that I've been here for for three years or so, I've just kind of had a whole array of different experiences. Um, whether it was you know, I mean, certainly at the start, I was kind of drinking, drinking from the firehouse a little bit in terms of just getting to know the business and and understanding the cast of characters and understanding what it was that we do. But um, relatively quickly, really within my first year in Greencore, we uh, we sold what was a billion dollar business in, in the US. And so I was quite involved in that, spent a good bit of time in the US. First of all, kind of resetting our strategy there and then progressing to sell, uh, sell the business, um, you know, m- more recently. And um and in particular, since I kind of took on the more explicit strategy role at the beginning of this year, um, thinking about um, how the world has changed through COVID disruption and how it might be different at the other end of, of COVID disruption. And then what we need to do as a business to be to be well set up for that, whether it's around investment in capability, whether it's around cost control, whether it's around you know going after customers in new um in new channels and kind of more digitally enabled channel channels as people as people kind of um, through COVID, have used more online um, online delivery services, and probably will keep that behaviour yeah. uh, as we come out the other side. Uh, there's just been a, kind of a whole a whole you know breadth of things on on the, on the pad, and and having the opportunity to try to to look at that in a focused way and, and come up with a plan um, that enables us to manage through that over the next uh, over the next few years has been uh, has been my my more recent focus, and has, has just been really energetic. Nice. Okay. So obviously uh, you mentioned COVID there and perhaps the, the opportunity to exploit online channels. Um, could you potentially expand a bit more on the specific challenges of the, the Green Core portfolio or your product offerings? Yeah, I mean, we for seven or eight months now at this stage have been um, 
we've kind of simplified what we're about in lots of ways and 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 we've run the business along three really clear priorities which was first and foremost keeping our people safe secondly keeping britain fred and and thirdly protecting the business and and each one of those kind of interlinks with each other and so for obvious reasons the the, the first priority was around um you know understanding the public health implications of what was going on what that meant for uh, from from an operational point of view in terms of keeping people safe in terms of implementing social distancing in terms of changing our processes both in factory and in office environments to um to to to, to really um uh, manage for the manage for the impact of the virus and uh, and do everything we, everything we could to ensure that we've got a safe working environment for for colleagues while also recognizing that um as a as a as a company is who's in food production um as a as a workforce that are that are essential workforce uh, that are essential workers and mm. um, that we needed to stay in production and and keep getting fed and finding ways to do that that um that respected that first priority but um, but that also worked for us commercially and worked for our customers commercially was was really important. And then thirdly, around protecting the business, um, actually continuing to find ways to um, uh, to grow the business. But the best, I mean, as you might imagine, a business like ours that's very heavily reliant on on food to go, on sandwiches and salads and sushi and the kind of products that people buy when they're out and about, mm. had, a, had a very negative impact on our on our demand overall. And so finding ways to, to backfill for some of that demand, to continue to, to win new business, even against the backdrop of, of a challenging volume and demand environment um, has, has, has also been a really important part of the focus. And so, you know, the kind of interaction of those three things around, around you know, people uh, protection, around, around uh, staying in production and around growing the business, protecting the business have, have been how we've, how we've focused for the last six or eight months and, yeah. and how we will continue to focus um, for the time ahead. Mm, interesting. Nice. Thanks for sharing that. Um, I noticed that we're kind of nearly at time here. We're at half 11 and obviously you don't want to take up too much of your time today, but um, <laughs> to close, Nigel, at each um, junction in your career path so far, we've noticed that, you know, you have, you've definitely exceeded. So in Trinity, you, you were awarded the gold medal. In McKinsey, you were promoted at a fast pace and likewise in Green Corps. Um, so yeah, once again, because I would love to know, um, is there any particular set of business or career principles uh, that you've followed since leaving university? Yeah, I guess, um, I guess uh, the first thing I'd say is, is um, kind of figure out what your life, um, what, what life you want to have uh, and what you want your life to look like rather than figuring out what your career is going to look like. Mm. Um, and so you know, choosing the kind of, the, the, there's a million and one interesting jobs out there and there's a million and one interesting uh, companies out there. Mm. But figuring out what what role you want uh, work to play for you, what you want to get out of work, what you want to get out of the other parts of your life are, are I think, pretty important. Um, and to the extent that I kind of encounter people in the professional world who I suppose aren't just partic aren't particularly happy, it's, uh, it's often because they've kind of focused on one, one element rather than the other, um, uh, and, and therefore kind of find themselves in a in in a scenario or in an area or kind of on a path that that they might not have chosen for themselves, even though they uh, even though they they th they kind of felt like they ticked the box along the way. Um, I guess I guess the second thing I'd say is um, is find people that you want to work with, um, probably much more than um, than areas or industries or, or topics. You know where where I've enjoyed my work and um, it's been when I've been working with really really great people and um, uh, we've 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 a great team here in, in Green Corps I, I I really really enjoy working with my colleagues have a lot of fun with my colleagues yeah. and that keeps me here same with with McKinsey same with the the presidency that I mentioned earlier it's always been in in the scenario where where you're working with really great people um, and I guess the third thing is um is don't take it too seriously and don't be too worried if you don't have a plan yet um you, <laughs> you, you I to hear that. blurb at the uh, at the beginning about the kind of path that I had, and as I listen as I listen to that back, it definitely sounds like after the fact there was a plan. There absolutely wasn't. So, um, <laughs> so if, uh, if if there isn't, um, if you if you do things that are in, enriching and that are that are uh, that make you that help you enjoy life and you're working with great people, I think uh, I think I think the the career will fall into place. Great, great. What a relief and what a 
great, I suppose, point to, to close on. Um, Nigel, thank you so much for your time. Um, I definitely got a lot of value out of that um, and loved hearing about each step. Um, it was short but sweet. We got we got a lot out of it. Um, and I think all the audience will, will definitely say the same. So yeah, just to close, I think uh, I'd like to say thanks again uh, on behalf of the D2 Consulting Group. And then, uh, of course, on behalf of the audience watching. Um, and in saying that, I, I think I think okay. end the meeting here, if that's okay. Sure. Thanks, Minnie. Let's take care. No problem at all. Nigel, thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> have a good day. Have a good Friday. Bye. You too. Have a great weekend. Thank you.